here's Ed Bernstein. I don't have to remind you because you're seeing all these commercials, Saturday begins early voting. Saturday. So it's within the next week. Let's get out and vote. And you can vote early, avoid the, the lines, the rush, and, and forgetting, quite honestly. Uh, with me today to talk about their votes is um, State Senator, soon to be your County Commissioner, uh, Richard Tick Sagerbloom. And a little bit later in the show, Tick, uh, Alyssa Kadish, who is running for the Supreme Court, will be here. And she's going to be a great judge. Well, she's a great judge. Well, she is a great judge. Great yeah. justice. Goes from judge to justice. I want to ask her a difference in those two terms. <laughs> Good okay. question. Um, you've been with the state in, in the state center for quite a while. You're looking to become a county commissioner. Um, two different jobs, right? Absolutely. And what people keep reminding me is the legislature is more of a policy place. We look at the big picture and and throughout policy, but the reality is. Day to day, it's the county commission, city council. They're the ones dealing with the potholes, the garbage collection, and and lots of transportation issues, sewer, homeless. So we, we really have a, a full plate. And what about that part of the job interests you compared to the policy part of the job? I think just having been up there and and working on policy. Um, It'd be fun to see how it actually is implemented, right. and and so much is discretionary. You, know, you pass a law, but you really don't know what they're going to do down there. Now I'll be able to actually grab it and, and go with it. And I'm really more into trying to make things happen, um, and so I think it's going to be very exciting. What what is the, the biggest transition? I mean, when you're up in the, in the state senate, you're up in Carson City, you're dealing with um, boy, not only the senate but the legislature, legislature, the assembly, the the governor, lieutenant governor. Um, down here, it's you know you're just dealing with what is it? Um, your, county, your fellow county commissioners. Right. Yeah. Well, the reality is, the legislature is a very complicated process. Uh, for example, when you're in the Senate, you have to get 11 votes to pass anything. So that means you got to find 10 other people. Then it has to go to the assembly. So you have to get 22 votes over there. Then you have to get the governor to sign it. So it's a multi-tiered process and a, and a real game to play. Whereas here, just four votes and you got something. So I, I'm looking at it being much simpler. I mean, you know what you get taking for granted, but find those four people and, and you can do stuff. And also the other thing is, we're doing it year round. Whereas up there, you, know, you go up every two years, you're there for four months, you find out where the bathroom is, and then it's time to go home. Whereas this will be like every day you go to work. And what's your opinion about that? I mean, you, you've been up there you know, quite a while, um, and, you know, in, uh, in it, it, both it, houses. We, Nevada is, is way too big and way too sophisticated to go every other year. Where there's only three states that, that go every other year like we do, and they're, they're small states. Texas is a little exception, but the reality is you need, it doesn't have to be a full-time legislature, but they have to go every year for at least a month or two. Because you, you make it, you write a bill, uh, the governor vetoes it, it takes two years to go back and try to override the veto, or you make a mistake. A lot of times you do these laws at the very end, make a mistake, it takes two years to go back and correct it. We've lost hundreds of millions of dollars in just that, trying to wait two years. Of course, some people have the argument against that is, hey, you know, we're much safer when they're not in session making new laws. Well, and that's true. I mean, if you look at our governmental structure in Nevada, it's really designed to be dysfunctional because everything, nothing matches. So you have the county commission districts which don't match the school board districts, and they don't match the legislative districts, and then the, the terms don't match, and then you have the city council which, which and mayor which elected in a different term, and anyway, it's, it, it's so complicated that nothing really fits together, and it's almost like a Rubik's Cube, but I think we can try to streamline things and make government work. Is that something that's really doable? I mean, you say you think you can <laughs> streamline it. I mean, I, 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 I mean, not maybe perfect, but yes. Um, for example, I just have a proposal that just the school board districts and the and the county commission districts would be the same because there's it, seven. It makes sense, right? There's seven of them for the whole county. Right. Why not have those two districts look the same? I can then work on school district issues. The school district candidate can look at me and say, well, maybe you know, if I'm doing a better job than he is, right. I'm going to take him out. So it gives a little competition. But but more importantly, why can't government work together? We shouldn't have these silos where, well, that's a city issue, that's a school board issue, that's a county issue. Let's, let's put ourselves together. Mm -hmm. And, and you, um, you live in, this, in the city. You've lived in the city right. for as long as I can remember. Right, since I moved back yeah. in 1980. Actually born in Boulder, Boulder City, city yeah. right? I right. mean, native Nevadan. Third generation. You're, I didn't know the state was that old. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, um, but so, why did you decide to run for the county commission instead of the city council? 
Uh, well, a couple reasons. First, uh, this district comes up to my, my current commissioner, Christian Kiliani's termed out, so it came up right now. Um, and then, truthfully, it's, it's a it's a more important job from my perspective. You know, it's it's you know, much more territory. Uh, you sit on the airport authority. You, you sit on a lot of different things. So it just it was too good to it's pass. It's more on. interesting too. Yep. Um, you're credited with shepherding the. Uh, Marijuana laws in um, in the state legislature. Um, it's been it's taken a long time for us to to. Uh, most people think we just kind of approved it in the last couple of years. This has really been a, what almost 18, 20 year ordeal. It was put in the constitution in two thousand. Yeah, so it's uh, it's just you know, it's been an eighteen year um, climb. Yeah. That, but it went, 2013 is when we actually got the, the law for the dispensaries there through. Right. So it's been, that's been five years. And when you look at where we've come in five years from you couldn't do anything to now you can go out there and legally buy it and, and, and there's dispensaries and there's other things happening, um, or want a beer. I mean, it, it's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And how has it fared? I mean, are you satisfied with the way things have gone? Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't take full credit for it, but I, I would say no one dreamed it could do, it has been implemented as smoothly as it has, as effectively as it has. Uh, we just got the numbers for July. It's it's eight million dollars just in, in just just strictly marijuana taxes. That's a hundred million dollars a year in marijuana taxes, which is phenomenal, way beyond what anybody predicted. Right. So and better than what I think Colorado even did, right? Yeah, and, and Washington when they first came yeah. out, we're way over what they did. We're almost where California is as mm -hmm. far as the first year. So it's it's really phenomenal. Yeah. And the only you know conversation I ever hear about that is that well the money is supposed to go to education, not all of it has. And can you straighten? that out? <laughs> well, I can try, but yeah. the reality is uh, the question two said the money that question two generated goes to education, and that has gone to education. Right. The governor also proposed a 10% tax, which we enacted, and that was supposed to go to education, and due to a variety of issues in the, in the legislature, we weren't able to directly put it there, but we prepaid it, essentially, and now we're paying that back. But but in this next session, starting in next February, that'll all be addressed, and I'm pretty confident that the money will all do, go right to education. And I I think it more importantly should go to the county where it's generated. So Clark County, which generates the, the lion's share of this money, should get the lion's well, share. Well, because there's counties that don't even allow exactly. the, the marijuana. Yeah, and they're they're gonna we're, be we're, we're too good for marijuana. We don't want it. Right. Well, then don't take our money, guys. Yeah, so, so. that's a valid point. Yeah, and I'd like to see the state come down with a check and say, here's $50 million from marijuana for your school district. You do what you want to do with it. You know, when you hear about this, that the money's earmarked for education, and then stuff happens with the budget and the legislature, and then all of a sudden, you know, they're looking at the education but budget and they're saying, well, you guys got $100 million over here, so we can slash it over here. I mean, so it's kind of taking from Peter to give to Paul, um, but, you know, this. You know, this I think people voted for this, so this would be additional money to help improve education, pay teachers more, and do some of the things that we need to do in Nevada. Absolutely, and that's what I would say is that the legislature make sure that that there's this statewide education budget. Everybody gets their piece, and then the marijuana money comes to Clark County on top of that. It's not substituted in; it's on top of what's there already, so right. you can actually see it make a difference because that's what people wanted. Right. Um, there's going to be a lot of changes on the county commission, one way or the other, right? Absolutely. We have uh, Chris G. retiring. We have Susan Brager um, is retiring. Steve Sisolak running for um, for governor. So um, if if you win, you you're, you're going to get in. Somebody will get in for Susan Brager's spot, and I guess somebody gets appointed if Sisolak wins. Correct. Right. The governor. Hey. Governor. Actually, he will appoint himself. He will appoint. <laughs> well, he would appoint his, his replacement. replacement. I mean, yeah. Right. So the he, it wouldn't be the sitting governor. It'd be once he officially becomes governor, then the seat is vacated and he would appoint somebody and then right. they'd have to run in the two, next election, right? right? two years. And then right. two others, um, Larry Brown and Lawrence Weekly, are both going to term out in two more years. So literally within the space of four years, there will be a whole new county commission, seven members. Is that, so, is that good or bad for the, the Clark County? Uh, I think, well, we'll have to wait and see. But I think in some ways it's good just to have a whole new... Um, 
breed. I mean, the people that are coming in are not like people that just walked off the street. They've been, you know, Jim Gibson's been a mayor. Right. Been, and Jim's brand new. Right. right. I forgot about yeah. him. Yeah. yeah, so he, he's been mayor and everything. I have a legislative service. Um, so virtually everybody has some kind of a background. They mm -hmm. can just walk off the, the turnip truck. Uh, you know, Marilyn Kirkpatrick is new. She was the speaker. So, I mean, there's a lot of institutional knowledge mm -hmm. there. But it's fun to kind of turn things over. Um, and I've been the recipient of, of term limits. Uh, and just seeing how that works, um, it, it does bring some new blood in. Right. And, and then what about, what do you look at when you look at con congeniality you know, within the... Uh Within our government, I mean, when you look at with the com composure, uh, uh, composition of the new uh, county commission, um, I, I don't see. Get along, well, so far, I mean, we'll yeah. have to see. You know, yeah. it's, uh, once you get in there and, and you start losing votes, maybe things will change. But but everybody that I know right now, they're very compatible. Um, they're let's, let's get down to business. They're not there for fluff. They're not trying to run for some higher office. Not trying to showboat mm -hmm. or anything. They just want to do the best job they can for Clark County. Yeah. You know, uh, transportation seems to be, you know, a big issue anymore with the freeway, all the construction going on in the freeway. You represent, or will represent, a you know, an older section of the county, right? So difficult to get to. Yeah, and that's actually one of the issues that I've I've, I've learned in, in this campaign is that, and when you think about it, I represent the east side of Las Vegas, um, and that area, has no development off 95 going from like downtown to Boulder City has, has helped happen in the recent, all these new interchanges everywhere else, but nothing right. really has happened. So I think it's time for us to, to step up and say, we want some, a piece of the action too. Possibly an interchange at Sahara 95, uh, possibly talking about moving Hollywood and having that go all the way across the base over there down to Galleria. So there's lots of things we can do, but the reality is people that live on the east side have a tough time getting back and forth to work. Right. The, the other thing I always hear about uh, some of the older sections in town is the need for parks and recreational facilities. Absolutely. And just coming in and, and making things look a little better. So we could clean up the streets more often. We could maybe put some trees or just, just mm -hmm. you know, one of the problems with old neighborhoods, another thing is power lines. Power lines are everywhere, and that just drives me crazy. Uh, so I've had bills in the legislature that I'd like to try to do here where we start to put some of those, especially on the major arterials, put those power lines on the ground just as a beautification thing. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a beautiful city, and, and we've got beautiful mountains. Um, when we have clear days, we can see them. So let, let's enjoy what we have. Mm -hmm. The other thing, just so you mentioned it, is that my district is is the heart of where they're trying to put that light rail, and I'm not sure if it's going to happen or not down Maryland Parkway, but that's right in the in the center of, of this district E, and anything we can do to either do that or maybe even just have electric buses that go regularly, but but that's that's something we can do. Mass transit we need desperately in this city. You know, everybody talks about you know uh, transportation on Maryland Parkway or monorails or whatever, but you, know, you can't even drive down a strip anymore. <laughs> You know, well, and I, 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 obviously the hotels have to be the big player, but I would love to sit down with them some more and say, look, let's have some kind of transportation and maybe close parts of it off. I mean, it's become a much more walkable area. You know, mm -hmm. All they're building is walkable places, the link and then the, the park. Uh, so maybe we have, I'll have the whole place walkable, but, but have some kind of transportation up and down the strip. I think it'd be great. And the other thing that just uh, you know, bugs me is the, the moving billboards. It seems to me they take up so much space and, and, they, and, and, and diesel fumes everywhere. That's, that's, there's got to be a way to regulate that a bit. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Look, this is Las Vegas. <laughs> I, I think, you know, if you want to keep being the city of the future, we need to do something about transportation on the Strip. Come on, uh, let's go uh, hotels, casinos. You know, let's close the street, put in moving sidewalks, moving light rail. I mean, this, this has got to be the Jetsons look, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we're always we reinvented ourselves. So yeah. then let's look around the world, find the best technology and do something. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're happy to pay for it. You know, we can add some more money to the room tax. We can build a stadium. We can build anything. Thank you. Uh, um, I was going to ask you, and I, didn't have to, I ran out of time. Sorry. But next time you're on, I need to find you. I want you to tell people how you got the name Tick. Okay, <laughs> that's the story in itself. Okay, we'll have next time. Okay, okay. but uh, thank you, uh, uh, State Senator Tick Sagerbloom. You go by Tick on the ballot, or Richard? Yeah, it's Tick on the ballot. It's Tick on the ballot. Okay, and uh, and County Commissioner yes. candidates. We'll be right back with Alyssa Kadish, who's uh, Judge Kadish is running for the Nevada Supreme Court. When sorry is not enough. Enough said. Call Ed. EdBernstein.com. We're back. Let's not forget 
um, Saturday starts early voting. With me is uh, Judge Alyssa Kadish, who is running for the Nevada Supreme Court. That's right. Thank you for having yes. me. Now, this is the most obvious first question. We just went through, um, um, you know, the. Um, I was going to say election, but it's, that's the whole point. It's not an election, a nomination of, um, um, of Judge Kavanaugh. In the U.S. Supreme Court, the president gets to choose somebody, and the Senate gets to you know, confirm it, okay. and they become a justice. You're running. In Nevada, for our Supreme Court, you have to run. That's right. What do you think about the mm. two different systems? Right. Yes. So in Nevada, all of our state court judges are elected, which a good number of states do that, although it is a minority. Um, so in, it's hard to compare them. You know, neither system is perfect, of mm. course. Um, the election system, uh, the concern I have is that there are a lot of people out there in the community that just don't know about our judicial candidates, don't know a lot about us, don't know who would do a good job or wouldn't do a good mm -hmm. job, and a lot of people end up either not voting in our race at all or picking none of the above, which effectively is like not voting in our race, or they're voting um, without knowing a whole lot about either of the candidates, so that's challenging because the job we do as a judge is so important. We really affect people's lives every single day and you want to have a good judge who's going to be prepared and read everything and rule based on the facts and the law. So there are some concerns there. Now the appointment process also has some um, some flaws also and it's gotten to be more and more political unfortunately so uh, I don't know neither system is perfect but I I do think it's important that the election system requires us to get out in the community and get to know the people in our community and hear their concerns about our legal system it's important for us to know about them and, and I was going to ask you that I mean how do you really get people to know who the candidates are I mean all you really know is what you see on television so you have one right. candidate talking well about themselves and the other candidate candidates talking, you know, <laughs> maliciously about the, the first candidate. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, and, and maybe there's exaggerations or half-truths and all these kind of commercials, but, but, I mean, how does somebody really learn? I mean, it's really no different than if you're running for governor. I mean, people get the same kind of information from TV. Right. Well, we have to, um, well, I don't know if we have to. I've been running a positive campaign. My television ads that I'm running are a positive ad about me and my background, the endorsements that I have and the support that I have in the community. And, and I don't think there's been any negative campaigning in my race at all, which I really appreciate. I don't think it should be that way, especially in a judicial race. I think there should be a difference. The judicial branch isn't supposed to be just another political branch. We're supposed to be neutral and I work very hard to to be neutral and not just that but to be someone that people can look to as a fair arbiter on their case when someone comes into my court I want them to feel comfortable that they're gonna get a fair shot no matter what side they're on and so you know we, we shouldn't be demeaning ourselves by running negative campaigning and so I haven't done that and and I hope I never will have to do that. You know, and it's refreshing that you have a campaign where that is not going on. Right. What, what are some of the important um, personality traits or characteristics that a, that a judge needs? Well I think you know one of the most important things is a judicial demeanor which means you need to be someone who is fair and patient and listens to people and considers everything and it shouldn't be someone who just starts yelling at people or is uh, disrespectful or condescending to the parties before us um, so that's really important then and of course integrity preparation um, work ethic. You have to be someone who works hard. Our courts are very busy places. We have a whole lot of cases. Uh, I hear a lot of cases now as a district judge and our Supreme Court also has a very large caseload compared to most of the country. So you need someone to be there who's going to work very hard, read everything and be prepared and to not come in with a bias one way or the other. We shouldn't be coming in with um, 
policy positions. We come in as someone who's going to look at the legal issues and make fair decisions considering everything before us. Yeah, and everything you just said was contrary to what we just witnessed in the <laughs> Supreme Court nominee. Every, everyone, I'm not going to ask you about it because right. I know you're not going to opine on it. I cannot. <laughs> because one of the things, you know, they're important is like, like we don't know if you're a Democrat or Republican. It's not important. It's, it's right. kind of a nonpartisan uh, situation when you're right. running for a judicial um, um, not, uh, office. But with Judge Kavanaugh, you certainly knew, and that kind of stuff came out. And it was not healthy for the it, country. It's unfortunate that the judicial nominations have become so politicized, and that's happened on both sides, frankly. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, our while we do run for office, uh, for our judicial offices here in Nevada, we do run as nonpartisans, and, and that's appropriate. That's the way it should be. We may have our own political views when we go and vote on things personally, mm -hmm. but as a judge, our personal political views don't, or at least shouldn't, have anything to do with the decisions that we make as a judge. And and so it, that's not important. We're not coming in to be, I'm not running for this office to be a legislator or to come in and say, I'm advocating for this policy or that policy. The policy is fairness and, and respect for the rule of law. Right. Well said. Um, I asked uh, Tix Egerman, we were kind of fooling around, and asking about the term judge and justice. Do you know, what is the difference? Because I mean, <laughs> you have a justice of the peace, right? right. Then you have, the Supreme, uh, you have district court judges, and you have a Supreme Court justice. Right. So um, I think in most places, justice is used for the highest court in the given jurisdiction. Right. So, of course, our Supreme Court justices are the United States Supreme Court justices, whereas our trial level and our appeals level are referred to as judges. Uh, I'm not sure of the origin of the justice of the peace term because right. it can be confusing sometimes because they have justice in their name, right. which makes you think they're like the Supreme Court justices, but they're um, a county court, which is actually a step below the district court judge uh, where I sit now. Right. So it yeah. can be confusing to people. When I'm out in the community, I do a lot of talking to explain to people what our different kinds of judges are, what muni ju municipal court judges do, what justices of the peace do, what district judges do. And because there are some city judges and county judges and state judges, it can be very confusing and people don't understand it. And you can see why people would have difficulty understanding uh, how those different roles work. Mm -hmm. So I, I, one of the things that I think is important for us as judges is to be out in the community helping our community members understand our legal system. You know, one of the changes we had in the uh, judicial system in the last couple of years was we uh, um, created a court of appeals. Right. Uh, and it's kind of an, and, and you went through the levels. We have the you know, municipal court and um, justice court, then right. top of that is district court. Right. Then it used to be the Supreme Court, but in between now, district court and the Supreme Court, we have the Court of Appeals. Right. And um, so it's you know kind of a, a, a new a new system we have in Nevada. Abby Silver is also going to become a Supreme Court justice, currently right. sitting on the Court of Appeals. Right. Has that. Court of Appeals been, uh, you know, uh, worked the way we thought it was going to work in Nevada. Are you happy with it? I am happy with it. I think it's been very helpful. We have a lot of appeals uh, in this state. So we have uh, seven Nevada Supreme Court justices and about 3,000 appeals are going to be filed this year. So now our system is a little different model than many other places. The way we set up our Court of Appeals, it's called a push down model. So all of our appeals are still filed with the Supreme Court and then the Supreme Court pushes down some of those to the Court of Appeals. There are three judges on the Court of Appeals and then they rule on those cases, at least initially. So uh, recently we've had as many as a thousand or I think a little over a thousand got pushed down from the Nevada Supreme Court to the Court of Appeals. So they actually alone resolved about a thousand cases in a year, which has helped the Supreme Court justices to be able to focus on the more difficult, more complex cases and the cases that have um, issues of first impression, meaning um, issues that haven't been resolved under Nevada law before. So it's the Nevada Supreme Court that is supposed to be addressing those issues and the Court of Appeals can help with the issues that are 
what we often refer to as error correction. That is, um, it's not needing to break new ground in the law, but the question is, did the judge properly follow the law or not? And so a lot of those cases have been addressed by the Court of Appeals. So um, we still have to work, now that we've got that system in place and running, we need to get our Supreme Court to resolve the cases that it keeps a little more quickly, and I look forward to working right. on that. Those cases that really create precedent, right? I mean, right. Um, our Supreme Court, I mean, was at one time was the, before we had this Court of Appeals, was the busiest Supreme Court in the country. I think that's right. And you're running to, uh, to replace Michael Cherry's seat, right? Correct. And Michael, because Michael, was just, Justice Cherry was a term limited out. There are no or term no, limits no, on our no? courts, but okay. he's uh, he will have Retiring. completed two six-year terms on the court, so he's choosing to retire after this year. He was also on the district court for, I think, eight years before that, and right. so he's going to um, retire after this year. But uh, the the members of the judiciary aren't subject to the term limits law. Well, you know, that was uh, most of the attorneys in our state, you know, look at losing Justice Cherry is a big loss, but I think they're all basically pretty happy that somebody like you is running for in, in that position. Well, thank you very uh, much. And, and our Supreme Court is composed of, of attorney or judges uh, north, south. And, you know, but the, but, you know, and I know we have this beautiful new building. It's actually across the street from my office. Yes. Looks great. You know, but most of what goes on in the Supreme Court is happening in Carson City. That's true. So we do have seven justices on the Nevada Supreme Court. Right. Only two of them are based in Las Vegas and have their full chambers and their staff actually uh, in Las Vegas. The other five are still based in Carson City. And when they built the new Supreme Court building downtown that you referred to, that's still the case. There's still two full chambers. Now there's visiting chambers for all of the justices, mm -hmm. so when the justices are down here, they have an office they can work in, but um, it's, there's not room for the staff. So my seat will be based in Carson City, and so I'll need to be up there uh, a good amount of the time. I'll need a place to uh, live up there. Um, and initially, I may be going back and forth for a while, and then I'll see what I do long term, whether I move up to Carson City or not. I predict you're going to have a lot of Southwest Airlines mileage. <laughs> you're going to get on that A-list, girl. Well, well I, I have already <laughs> made the A-list this year from campaigning around the state in this statewide race. Yes, I'm proud of having that A-list on Southwest yeah. now. Well, thank you very much, uh, Judge Alyssa uh, Kadish, running for Nevada Supreme Court. This is a uh, I can't tell you how important these races are, particularly these judicial races that you don't hear a lot about. You hear a lot about U.S. Senate, Congress, Governor, but for most people, your lives are affected mostly by what goes on in the Supreme Court and in the lower courts. So this is uh, early voting has begun Saturday, will begin Saturday. Get out there and vote. Thank you. Good thing you have insurance. The lady in front of you just called that Bernstein. Enough said. Call Ed. EdBernstein.com.